Hi, this is the pre-class lecture part of lecture 22. I'm just going to go through a brief introduction to OCD, um, covering the main symptom presentations um, and giving you some descriptive psychopathology. So today's lecture is lecture 22, um, part one. We're going to just be talking about what is OCD. In the rest of this unit on obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders, we're going to cover hoarding disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, tick disorder, trichotillomania, and dermatillomania. So this is the full outline for lecture 22. Um, today, we're just going to be discussing what is OCD and covering the main categories of obsessions and compulsions. So an obsession is defined as any unwanted thought or urge that causes anxiety or discomfort that an individual is motivated to try to ignore, suppress, or neutralize. A compulsion is defined as a behavior that's performed to relieve the anxiety or discomfort caused by an obsession. So compulsive behaviors are typically very repetitive. They're often done more times in a row, more often or in a more ritualized way than people would do the same action if it wasn't driven by the need to neutralize or get rid of an obsession. Compulsions by definition are not realistically connected to what they're designed to neutralize or prevent or they might just be excessive to accomplish that goal. Finally, and importantly, compulsions are difficult to stop or control. People express that they feel driven to perform them. They feel like they can't relax, can't feel okay, can't calm down until they've performed the compulsions the right way or enough times or just until it feels right. Obsessive compulsive disorder is defined by the presence of both obsessions and compulsions. In OCD, Obsessions and compulsions take up a lot of a person's time, more than an hour a day. And together, the obsessions and compulsions cause distress or impairment. Some people with OCD are kind of towing the line a little bit between um, OCD and something that looks sort of like delusional disorder. When people with OCD have poor insight into the nature of their obsessions and compulsions, when they really believe that the compulsions they're doing aren't excessive, aren't ritualistic, are in some way directly connected to the outcome that they're trying to prevent um, and lack the insight to say that the, the compulsions are upset or um, excessive or that if they didn't do the compulsions, probably things would still be fine. This is when OCD can kind of tip over into a delusion, into believing something wholeheartedly um, that can't be proven to be real. That's quite rare though. Most people with OCD have insight into the fact that their compulsions are excessive and unnecessary, but there's just some driving force that makes them feel unable to stop doing them. So as an example of what the combination, the interplay of obsess obsessions and compulsions might look like, say we have a patient named Sarah who gets up several times every night to make sure that her apartment door is locked. This is something that she does every night. And every time she checks the door, it's always locked. She never forgets to lock, to lock it. But when she gets up to check, she engages in the ritual of unlocking and relocking the door before going back to bed, just so that she can know that she actually did it. After doing this ritual of checking, unlocking, and relocking, Sarah feels better for a while, but then after some time passes, she starts to doubt again that she really did relock the door properly. So she has to get up and do the whole thing over again. She feels frustrated by this ritual because it's causing her to lose sleep. Um, it's taking up time at night but she really believes that if she doesn't do it, her anxiety will get worse and will cost her sleep anyway. She really thinks that if she stays in bed with that feeling of uncertainty that maybe the door isn't properly locked, she will be up all night unable to sleep or something bad might really happen. So this is what um, obsessions and compulsions look like over time. So on the, on the y-axis is Sarah's anxiety level and on the x-axis is time in bed. So shortly after getting in bed, after locking the apartment door for the night, she starts to have this thought, did I forget to lock the door? This is an example of an obsession. It's an intrusive, unwanted thought that causes anxiety and distress. In response to the obsession and in order to get the obsession out of her mind and relieve the anxiety and uncertainty and distress that it causes, Sarah engages in the compulsion of getting up, unlocking and relocking the door. Like all avoidance behaviors, doing this compulsion makes her anxiety decrease sharply. She feels a lot better after doing it. But after she gets back in bed and some more time passes, she starts to have that obsessive thought again. It pops back into her head. Did I turn it all the way? Did I hear it click? Is it really locked? 
this is an example of an intrusive unwanted obsession coming back even after the compulsion to discharge it, neutralize it, relieve it was completed. Um, so in response to the obsession, Sarah again gets up, engages in the compulsion, unlocks the door, relocks the door. And once again, her anxiety decreases sharply. This type of um, up and down pattern of anxiety, anxiety rising in response to obsessions and sharply decreasing temporarily in response to compulsions until the next obsession comes along is typical of OCD. So just as I said, just like all avoidant behavior, compulsive behavior is strongly negatively reinforced. Anything that we do that helps us quickly and immediately relieve anxiety is negatively reinforced because things that make us feel better, engaging in behaviors that reduce anxiety are rewarding, reinforcing. But similar to avoidance, engaging in compulsive behaviors in response to obsessions prevents those obsessions or the anxiety that they cause from peaking and then starting to decline as the individual experiences habituation where their parasympathetic nervous system takes over, calms down their sympathetic arousal in the absence of an increased threat, and they experience safety learning, learning that if they don't engage in avoidant behavior, nothing bad is going to happen. OCD kind of looks like this repetitive cycle where obsessions are randomly triggered. Um, they're triggered by thoughts, by the environment. They lead to increased anxiety. People engage in a compulsive behavior to relieve the anxiety. Anxiety is lowered temporarily, but inevitably the obsession pops back up. A thought triggers it, the environment triggers it, the passage of time triggers it. In this sense, OCD is a little different than the anxiety disorders that we've talked about because what is being avoided isn't necessarily a situation in the real world. It's not even a physical feeling. It's the thought, it's the obsession. The obsession itself causes anxiety in the absence of really any changes in the environment. This is different than panic disorder where what's causing the anxiety and driving the avoidance is a physiological change that's interpreted as a panic attack. Um, it's different than GAD where what's being avoided is a specific feared outcome from worry or something like uncertainty or an emotional contrast. It's different from a specific phobia where what's being avoided is a specific object or situation that when it's not present in the environment doesn't cause any anxiety at all. What's being avoided in OCD is the anxiety and tension that comes with an obsessive thought. And obsessive thoughts can feel like they come out of nowhere. So they can be very hard to escape from. And that's why they reinforce constant engagement and compulsive behavior. OCD tends to have an onset in childhood, adolescence, or young adulthood. About a quarter of cases have a pediatric onset. Um, and on average, onset is somewhere between early adolescence to mid young adulthood. So like 14 to 25. It's relatively rare for someone to have their first onset of OCD as an adult. So onset after 35 is relatively uncommon. This is a disorder that is pretty strongly neurobiological as we'll talk about in the etiology lecture and that tends to start early in life. OCD is relatively uncommon. So the prevalence of one to 3% is more along the lines of the prevalence of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, much lower than the prevalence of anxiety disorders and depression. If it's not treated, OCD tends to persist, but like anxiety disorders and depression, it can sometimes wax and wane. When a person is under more stress, when their overall anxiety level is higher, OCD symptoms tend to get worse. Those intrusive thoughts tend to be more frequent. This lecture is really gonna focus on describing the different content and manifestation of OCD, but OCD can't be defined or characterized by the content for an individual because the content changes over time. And as I'm gonna talk about, OCD tends to grab onto whatever is important to the person at any given time in their life. And this is what the obsessions focus on. So in the rest of this lecture, I'm going to cover manifestations of OCD that are kind of defined by the content of obsessions. And I'm really going to focus on obsessions about contamination, obsessions characterized by forbidden thoughts, obsessions characterized by avoiding harm or doubting, and obsessions that have to do with symmetry, order, and counting. So contamination OCD is probably the most prototypical example of OCD. It might be like the stereotype of OCD that first pops into your head. This typically has to do with obsessions about the presence of germs or toxins. 
Um, sometimes the contamination can be a little bit more metaphorical or spiritual than that, but generally it has to do with a real life um, toxin or microbe. The compulsions associated with obsessions about contamination are meant to either help the person avoid coming into contact with the feared contaminant, to neutralize the contaminant by washing or cleaning surfaces, or to seek reassurance that one isn't contaminated or sick or affected by a toxin in any way. You're gonna watch this full video um, for homework after the um, Wednesday's class. But this is just a brief snapshot of someone discussing his contamination obsessions and compulsions that revolve around obsessions that food might be contaminated with foodborne pathogens. So in the past, I was terrified of eating something bad. I was terrified of Sorry. other people, bad food and them dying and me getting blamed for it. I was always checking food and looking at it and, and Googling things online to see if food was okay. I was always Googling symptoms and checking symptoms like, and thinking about what I ate and like, oh, did that look like that was contaminated or maybe that place didn't look so clean and oh, what about that? Uh, I was constantly obsessing about food. I was avoiding food. I'd throw away food if I thought there was any chance that not just that it was contaminated, but maybe it was too close to something that was contaminated. Uh, I was only cooking with frozen food. So one, because I was convinced, the, you know, I thought food was poison. So I would only buy frozen food because that was made by companies and I'd sue the company. Uh, but also I didn't want to touch raw meat. So I was terrified I was going to touch raw meat and spread that. But then also when I would cook meat, I would just cook it beyond the rubbery burnt stage because I could never be certain like, oh, if it really looked cooked enough. I had a very poor relationship with food. Okay, so what he described was intrusive thoughts relating to food safety. So is this food contaminated? Is this food expired? Has this food come into contact with raw meat or with some other source of foodborne illness? The behaviors he described that helped him in the short term to cope with the, these obsessional thoughts were things like checking. So checking expiration dates, Googling symptoms to check if he had any, um, checking meat to see if it looked fully cooked. He engaged in neutralizing or cleaning exposure, or um, obsession, or, sorry, neutralizing or cleaning compulsions. So for example, really, really overcooking meat, cooking it until it was really done. Um, only cooking with frozen meat. So this is, as he described it, kind of a way of making it less likely that the food was contaminated because the food was mass produced and a company was responsible for it. So the actions he's describing are compulsions because they're done in direct response to intrusive thoughts about food safety. They're done to temporarily relieve the anxiety that comes with the obsession, the worry, what if this food isn't safe? And they are repetitive, sometimes ritualistic. So cooking food until it looked just right and definitely excessive to achieve the goal of maintaining food safety. And we know that, they're, that they are excessive to that goal because everyone wants to make sure that their food is safe, but most people don't go to these extreme lengths to make sure of it. So we know that we can keep our food safe without overcooking meat, without throwing things away before their expiration date, without throwing things away if they were in the refrigerator at the same time as something expired. This is an example of obsessions and compulsions related to contamination. Forbidden thoughts OCD is much less well understood. So forbidden thoughts has to do with obsessions, so intrusive thoughts that the person finds aberrant or that go against their self-concept in some way. So often forbidden thoughts kind of start with what if? What if I'm gay and a straight person or what if I'm actually straight and a gay person? What if I'm a pedophile or a rapist? What if I'm not really in love with my partner? What if I jumped off a bridge? What if I rammed my car into a crowd? What if I stood up in class and screamed obscenities? What if I intentionally did something that violated my religious practices? Basically, these thoughts boil down to what if I'm somehow a bad person? What if I do something evil? What if I'm not the person I think I am? Common compulsions associated with having these kinds of intrusive thoughts, which some people might express as almost like an intrusive urge to do these things that they think are bad, um, or that some people experience as just kind of constant doubting 
and repeated sort of ruminating on what if, what if I'm gay? What if I'm um, not in love with my partner? So to try to discharge these obsessive thoughts and relieve them, people might engage in reassurance seeking from other people. So asking friends and family, what if I'm not a good person? Do you think I'm a good person? Asking religious leaders, what if I went, would I go to hell if I accidentally ate pork? Um, what would I go to hell if I did it on purpose? Reassurance seeking can be internal. So it can be this kind of repetitive process of telling yourself, um, well, if I didn't really love her, I wouldn't have agreed to move in together. I wouldn't have said, I love you first. I wouldn't have had sex with her the other day. Or it can involve repeatedly confessing. So trying to discharge this perceived feeling of guilt by telling people about your forbidden thoughts. All of this is an effort to reassure yourself or to have someone else reassure you that the thoughts are not true, that you are the person that you think you are, that your intentions are good, that you're not a bad person. People with these compulsions might engage in checking. So um, if you have compulsions about hurting your family, stabbing your mom, you might sort of repeatedly like go into the part of the house where she is just to look and reassure yourself, remind yourself that she's alive. If you have compulsions about not being attracted to the gender that you think that you're attracted to, you might compulsively look at images of people of that preferred gender to try to confirm that you're attracted to them. Avoidance is really common. So if you have intrusive thoughts that maybe you're a rapist or a pedophile or that you might commit a violent act, you might try to stay far away from potential victims. I had a patient who wouldn't use knives when she was in the house with another person and she would actually put her cat in the bathroom if she had to do anything with a knife because she had intrusive forbidden thoughts about stabbing people. And so to avoid any possibility of doing that, she would make sure that she never touched knives or was around knives when there was another person in the house or in the room with her. Um, so that was an example of refusing to use potential weapons. Um, and people might, people with intrusive thoughts about blurting out obscenities or saying something unkind to someone might avoid talking. It might even get to the extent that it looks like selective mutism, but it's not driven by kind of this feeling of inhibition and avoiding the demand of talking because of social anxiety. It's driven by avoiding even the possibility that you would open your mouth and say something that you don't want to say. Neutralizing our uh, neutralizing compulsions are also common here. So doing something to kind of undo the bad thought that you had. Um, so trying to immediately intentionally think a good thought, trying to do something nice for the person that you thought of harming. So if you had an intrusive thought about stabbing your mom, um, offering to pick up groceries on your way home from school. In some people, this can look like punishing yourself for having bad thoughts. I had a patient who uh, would punch himself in the head when he had intrusive forbidden thoughts. For the longest time, he wouldn't verbally express what those thoughts were. He was afraid to even say them out loud because in his mind, the logic of his OCD said that if he verbalized them, it would make them more true. Um, but it turns out that the forbidden thoughts he was having were about murdering me. I was his therapist. So he engaged in all kinds of avoidance behaviors too. He would um, sit on his hands when we were in the room together. He would not look at me. He would always want to have the door open during therapy sessions. Um, and he would punish himself every time he had one of these thoughts. So this is an example from a TV show of a neutralizing compulsion for forbidden thoughts. This is from the TV show, Pure. And her forbidden thoughts are sexual in nature. She has intrusive images of sexual content. Um, she refers to it as, I see naked people. And in the show, she doesn't immediately realize that what she has is OCD. Like many people with forbidden thoughts OCD, she's used to taking her thoughts at face value. And she thinks that if she's thinking these things, it must mean that it's because she wants to be thinking these things that these thoughts are somehow her own and that they're reflecting something that she wants. So initially she goes to meetings for sex addicts, but then she learns over time that these thoughts are not appetitive. They're not a drive or a motivator that she actually wants to engage in. She finds them disgusting and embarrassing. So when she has these thoughts that, thoughts that she finds disgusting and embarrassing, she engages in a neutralizing compulsion. And that's what's shown here.
what you all get. So the compulsion that she's engaging in is kind of forcibly trying to suppress these thoughts. You can see it on her face. She blinks really hard to try to clear the image from her mind. Um, if she has an intrusive sexual thought about a person that she's interacting with, she quickly looks away from them. To some extent, making this like obvious facial expression when she's trying to neutralize the thought could be a compulsion in and of itself. Um, making it really obvious that she finds the thoughts unpleasant and disgusting could be a way of reassuring herself that the thoughts are not hers, that they're not thoughts that she wants to be having. So forbidden thoughts, OCD is really, really commonly misunderstood. And these misunderstandings can actually lead to really negative outcomes for patients. A common example of forbidden thoughts, OCD happens postpartum um, after someone has given birth. One manifestation of postpartum OCD has to do with intrusive thoughts about hurting the baby. And often people who have never had OCD before, sometimes OCD does come on due to hormonal changes and stress associated with childbirth. So someone who's never had these thoughts before might really believe that because they think that thoughts and urges somehow come from the unconscious mind or reflect real desires because they believe that people are fully in control of their thoughts or because they believe that if you have an urge or a thought, it means that eventually you will act on it. They believe that they're a danger to their baby. And so they report to the emergency room and tell physicians that they're gonna hurt their child, um, which can lead to diagnoses of psychosis when in reality, they're just having these intrusive thoughts. In fact, precisely because the person finds the thought so aberrant and so bad, um, that's why those thoughts are so persistent and so distressing. And it's why they cause so much repetitive avoidance in the form of compulsions and why they become so strongly reinforced. So in reality, forbidden thoughts about hurting other people, about being a pedophile or a rapist, about doubting your sexual orientation, um, they cause anxiety and distress. If these thoughts were repetitive, if they were motivating behavior, they would be associated with excitement or arousal. Um, people engage in compulsions because they have this misconception that if they don't do something to get rid of the thought, they will inevitably act on it. That's not true at all. If the person didn't do the compulsion to neutralize their thought, they still wouldn't act on it. What compulsions do is they relieve anxiety and distress. They don't prevent us from acting on our thoughts. So the reason forbidden thoughts are so distressing is precisely because they go against the person's values, morals, or identity. So when I was working with this kid who had obsessive intrusive thoughts about hurting me or killing me, I had absolutely no anxiety or worries that he was actually going to act on them. It wasn't who he was. He was so strongly motivated not to hurt me that he was going to such extremes as punching himself in the head or refusing to speak. Um, someone who actually wanted to hurt me would not do all those things. Similarly, the patient who wouldn't use knives in the same room as other people, when she was engaged in exposure therapy, one exposure that we did was she actually brought a knife into my office and after working our way up to it with other exposures, she actually held the knife up against my throat for five minutes to prove to herself that even if she put herself in a situation where she could act on those thoughts and didn't do anything to neutralize them or try to suppress them, she still wouldn't act on them. That's an example of an exposure that produced both habituation and safety learning. So to summarize, forbidden thoughts are intrusive thoughts or images that cause the person to fear that they are becoming something or someone that they don't wanna be or that they'll do something really wrong or really embarrassing or just really out of character. And the content of the forbidden thoughts tends to depend on what's important to the individual um, to some extent. So, Religious forbidden thoughts, forbidden thoughts about intentionally or accidentally violating a religious principle or not engaging in a religious practice are more common in people who are religious. Um, it's not a coincidence that people who are observant Muslims or keep kosher who develop forbidden thoughts OCD become really fixated on the idea of consuming pork, whereas someone who doesn't have those religious practices has forbidden thoughts about engaging in some other behavior. Forbidden thoughts about sexuality and gender identity are much more common in teenagers because this is an age where it's kind of developmentally normal to have some confusion or questions about these things. And forbidden thoughts about harming a newborn baby are super common in new parents. Um, forbidden thoughts about not wanting to hurt other people obviously go against what's 
important to almost everyone. Nobody wants to be a bad person. Nobody wants to hurt others. The third um, category of OCD based on obsession content is categorized as OCD related to harm avoidance or obsessive doubting. So this is kind of what the cycle of harm avoidance and doubting looks like. This relates to the first example of Sarah who got up repeatedly at night to check that the door is locked. So the content of obsessions has to do with harm avoidance. People obsess about possible danger that could befall them. Compulsions are designed to relieve the anxiety about that danger. They might sort of look like actions that you would actually take to prevent that feared outcome, but because they're compulsions, they're excessive, they're more repetitive than they need to be. And sometimes they're actually not directly connected to preventing the bad outcome. So in the example of Sarah, getting up and checking that the door is locked does prevent the feared outcome of someone breaking into the house. But most people who lock their doors at night only feel the need to do it once. Um, so the part that makes her behavior compulsion is that it's repetitive and excessive. She does it more than she needs to do to guarantee that she's safe. Um, an example where a compulsion relieves anxiety about a feared harm or danger, but isn't necessarily directly connected in a logical way to preventing that feared outcome or danger could be, um, I had a patient who had, she was worried about her parents dying. She was a kid um, and she was worried that her parents would die in their sleep. So in order in her mind to prevent that feared outcome from happening, she had this very elaborate bedtime ritual with her parents when they tucked her in where her mom and dad both had to say certain scripted words in the right order and with the right tone and inflection. And she feared that if they didn't say those words exactly right, they would be in danger of dying in their sleep. So that's an example of a compulsion who's, that is performed because in the patient's mind it reduces the danger, but it's not directly connected to actually preventing the danger. So either way, whether the compulsion is directly connected to preventing danger or not, when it's performed, it temporarily relieves the anxiety. But over time, the intrusive obsessive thoughts come back um, and the person starts to wonder whether that compulsion that they did to prevent the feared outcome was done properly. They might even start to doubt whether they did it at all. So people with these types of obsessions and compulsions often engage in checking and repeating compulsions to try to completely eliminate any doubt that the steps they took to prevent danger were adequate and that they were done properly. So this is another video that you're gonna be watching for homework, um, but I really like this because he goes through um, an explanation of an exposure for OCD really well and explains some of the thought process behind harm and doubting OCD symptoms. Well, here's our kitchen part of it at least. You know, a lot of people, including myself, through the years have had trouble with turning things on and off. Why? Well, OCD always gives you that uncertainty. It always gives you the what ifs. What if you didn't turn it off all the way and there's a gas leak and you're gonna blow up the whole house and blow up the whole neighborhood? What if you turn off or don't turn off a light switch? Is the electricity going to do something to the magical to the house and it's gonna be all your fault? That's the what ifs, but remember, don't ever forget that OCD always lies. It always lies. So the process is three parts. The first part is you have to turn on in your brain and in your heart, the trust button. Part of you does trust your senses. You trust what you see and what you hear and what you feel. In this case, it's what I see and what I feel. The next part is, you have to risk doing it. You do it. The third part is you got to walk away. Walk away and feel the discomfort to get comfort. Feel discomfort to get comfort. That's part of recovery. That's part of getting better. Okay. Let's start with this one, the stove. Here we go. All right, here we go. I see that it's on, we're making some tea. Now I'm gonna turn on my trust button in my head and trust. Now I'm gonna take the risk, second, take the risk and I'm gonna turn it off. Now we'll use my senses and see that it's off. It is off. 
I saw that it's off and I felt that it's off. Now what I'm gonna do is really important. I'm gonna walk away. And no matter what I feel, I'm gonna still walk away. I'm gonna feel it, feel discomfort. Here I go, I'm walking away. Now look, am I saying this is easy? No, it's not easy. Of course it's not easy. You gotta work at this, just like everything else in OCD recovery, you have to work at it. You have to put some effort into it. But does it get easier? Yes, it does. Because every time you change your behavior in the right direction, the brain just follows along. It just follows along and it starts to change. And before you know it, you're saying, why was I turning off, having problems turning off anything? Really, truly. Turn on the trust button in your brain. Trust just a little bit or even pretend to trust. Then take the risk, you can do it, and then walk away. And if you feel some discomfort, feel the feelings and do it anyway. Walk away and feel discomfort, it's okay, you felt it before, and it will calm down on its own. Believe me, it will calm down on its own if you do absolutely nothing, just feel it. Okay, so what he was talking about there was habituation. Um, having an intrusive thought and obsession, what if I didn't do my compulsion right? What if I didn't do enough to keep myself safe? Causes anxiety and discomfort. Doing a compulsion would relieve that anxiety and discomfort really quickly, but you would never get the opportunity to learn what happens if I don't do the compulsion. So he's focusing on habituation. If you let yourself feel the discomfort long enough, it'll go away on its own. The other piece to this is safety learning. You have to learn that if you trust your perception. I saw myself turning off the stove. I remember I turned off the stove. I know I turned off the stove. In fact, I've never in my life left the stove on. If you trust that reality um, and don't believe the obsessions that pop into your head, like what if this is the very first time ever in my life I leave the stove on and I kill my whole family, you will learn through safety learning that you don't have to listen to those obsessions, that those obsessions don't give you good information and that you can trust your perceptions and your memories. Yep. So the last category of obsession content we're gonna talk about is symmetry, order, and counting. So the core of this OCD content is this sort of feeling that there is a specific right way to perform actions, to arrange items, or to think. So as an example, um, this is, from the show Friends, it's an example of someone who has ordering and arranging obsessions, just a feeling of like extreme wrongness and discomfort when she feels like things are not in the right place, not where they're supposed to go. Ta -da! Are we greeting each other this way now? Because I like that. <laughs> all those attachments on the vacuum except for that little round one with the bristles i don't know what that's for oh yeah nobody knows and we're not supposed to ask <laughs> oh what do you think very clean it's great. Really, really it looks great very clean. oh i i see you moved the green ottoman <laughs> how did that happen i don't know i, I thought it looked better there and, I, and also, it's an extra cedar on the coffee table. Yeah, it, it's interesting. <laughs> but you know what? It, just for fun, let's see what it looked like in the old spot. <laughs> I, just to compare. Let's see. Ha! Well, it looks good there, too. Let's just leave it there for a while. <laughs> I can't believe you tried to move the green ottoman. <laughs> Thank God you didn't try to fan out the magazines. I mean, she'll scratch your eyes right out. Okay, so in this last category of OCD symptoms, it can sometimes be a little harder to identify the obsession. What is the actual intrusive thought that's causing the discomfort? And then what's the compulsion that's done to relieve it? So in this example, the intrusive thought, it might not even be verbalized in words. It might just be a feeling, a feeling of discomfort, a feeling of something not being quite right. This is called incompleteness in the OCD literature, and we're gonna talk about it a lot more in the next um, lecture. Um, but basically, when someone with this form of OCD sees something that's wrong, not in the right place, not done the right way, not done the right number of times, they just have this feeling of wrongness. And the thought 
I am not going to be comfortable until I fix this. The compulsion that's done to relieve that thought is to put things back in the right place, to do things over and over and over again until the thought goes away, um, or to think a certain way, do things in a certain pattern, um, take a certain number of steps. I had a patient who felt really wrong and uncomfortable when she crossed a threshold with an odd number of steps. So she would have to sort of plan how many steps it would take from the time that she saw a door until she got to the door and make sure that she took an even number of steps and that her last step through the door was happening on an even number. Um, she couldn't necessarily, there wasn't any feared consequence that would happen. She didn't think that like her family would die or that she would become a bad person or something if she didn't do this correctly. She just felt really uncomfortable and like the discomfort wouldn't go away until she fixed it somehow. And the way that she fixed it was by backing out of the door um, and trying again until she could approach the door in an even number of steps. Um, many people with these kinds of obsessions do have like compulsions related to numbers or evenness or doing things in a certain pattern. I had another patient who, um, if she accidentally like touched herself, like if her arm brushed against her leg and she was walking, she felt really wrong and uncomfortable until she did the same motion on the other side of her body. She just felt sort of unbalanced and wrong if she touched one side of her body and not the other. So most people with OCD don't just have OCD symptoms, obsessions from one of these categories. So this is a video of someone talking about how she has both contamination obsessions and symmetry and counting obsessions and that she, has, she feels sort of wrong or incomplete if she doesn't engage in her compulsions to neutralize contamination in the exact right way. The intrusive thoughts. So this is the result of excessive hand washing. As you can see, my hands are very red, they're very dry, they're very cracked. I also have contamination OCD. I don't, I know that there's this misconception around OCD that it is just hand washing and it's not, there's so much to OCD, but this is a part of my OCD where I will wash my hands up to 60 times a day, um, generally four times each. And then if my urges consist, it will be 16 because four times four. And I have a thing about the number four. Ever since I was younger, I've heard the phrase third time lucky. And I think, well, what if that's jinxed it? So now every time it gets past the number three to a number four, I feel more at ease. So, I'm in so this is an example of how compulsions kind of have their own logic that doesn't necessarily make sense and doesn't really relate to the feared outcome that the compulsions are trying to prevent if there is one. So for her, doing things three times can feel really uncomfortable because she has this obsession, this intrusive thought. There's the saying that the third time is lucky. So what if by having this thought that the third time is lucky, I jinxed what I'm doing and I made it unlucky. So I should do it another time, a fourth time. That's an obsession. It's an intrusive thought that causes anxiety and discomfort. And the way she gets rid of that obsession is by doing whatever it was that she was doing a fourth time. Um, she has other sort of symmetry and counting obsessions related to the number four. So she also engages in hand washing compulsions to neutralize contamination thoughts in intervals of four. So just to review, um, the categories of compulsion that we've been talking about include behaviors that help to avoid a feared outcome, um, avoid something that your obsessions are telling you is dangerous or would be really uncomfortable checking to make sure something bad or feared because of your obsessions hasn't happened, engaging in an action or a mental action like a thought to try to neutralize a behavior or a thought that you have an obsession about, that your obsessions make you feel is bad, seeking reassurance that your feared outcome hasn't come true or that you aren't a bad person, counting or doing things in a certain order or number of times, and ordering or arranging objects in a certain way. So in general, compulsive, compulsive behaviors are functionally related to obsessions. There is a specific behavior that people with OCD can do to feel better about a specific obsession. But there's no one-to-one -one relationship between the content of obsessions and the form of compulsions. Sometimes the form of compulsions seem sort of logically related to the content of obsessions, like checking that your door is locked or checking that you turned your stove off because you're afraid of burglars or burning the house down, respectively. But sometimes it doesn't there isn't any logic to it, even to the person. The obsession is just a feeling of discomfort, a feeling that something isn't right. 
the ottomans in the wrong place. I touched my body on the right side, but not on the left side. I did something three times. And what if I jinxed it? I should do it the fourth time. Those are examples of obsessions, intrusive thoughts that something is just wrong. Um, and any compulsion that relieves them only relieves them because of that person's kind of internal OCD logic. So that is the end of this presentation. This is kind of just an overview of like, what is OCD? What does it look like functional? In class, I'm gonna talk a lot more about the etiology of OCD and um, our model of um, predisposition and perpetuation of OCD.